My son lives in Israel and works with the International Committee of the Red Cross. When the um, Hamas missiles were being fired at Tel Aviv, he was messaging us that he and his wife were OK in their tiny safe room. His dog was totally distressed. My son goes down regularly to the Stelot and the other places on the Gaza border for the Red Cross. Why is the suffering of innocent civilians being attacked, it's innocent Israeli civilians being attacked, and the Ham Hamas being ignored? Randa Adolfata. I'm so, I'm so happy that your son has a safe house to go to. If only Gazans had the opportunity to escape the most densely populated place in the entire world and it's been under a blockade by Israel for 14 years, cut off from the rest of Palestine. It's it got absolutely no freedom of movement. And so when you have a military power backed and funded by the US, $3.8 billion a year, you have wet, the state-of-the-art advanced weapons dropping bombs on civilians, and you're talking to me about the safety of Israelis, where are Palestinians in Gaza supposed to go to? Your, your son's puppy, your son's dog was scared. There are children who were massacred and slaughtered. Nine Palestinian families have been wiped off the civil registry. Just yesterday, there was a tweet about that. Nine Palestinian families no longer exist, obliterated. And, and you're talking to me about Israeli safety? Israel has state-of-the-art weapons defence system and missile defence system. Where do Palestinians go when they are being bombarded? by the IDF, by the, one of the most powerful nuclear powers in the world? Where is their protection? Where are the people there to protect them from that, that onslaught? And Israel is targeting civilians. Israel, yes, it is targeting civilians. Israel has access to, because it is the occupier, the population registry for Palestine. So it has the names, the ages, the residential addresses of every single Palestinian in Gaza, which is why it can make a phone call to say, we're going to bomb this, this residential tower at so-and-so time. Rana, I'm just going to take us back to the question, though, which was about... <laughs> ..the role of Hamas and, and the impact on Israeli civilians. We've got a few questions on this. Dave Sharma, could I ask you for a response to that question? Well, look, I, I mourn the loss of life on both sides of this conflict, innocent civilians on both sides of this conflict. Um, every loss of life is regrettable on the Israeli side and on the Palestinian side, and many people have suffered through this conflict, in, in my view, um, needlessly. This wasn't a conflict that needed to happen. Um, Why did it happen? The, the proximate cause was that Hamas started to fire rockets at Israeli civilian Nonsense. populations. And that's, that's right. There have been five conflicts. Since Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005, there have been at least five conflicts between uh, Hamas and Israel. And they've almost... One started because an Israeli soldier was kidnapped and abducted, Gilad Shalit. Many others have started because of rocket fire from um, Hamas. I can't understand why Hamas does this because it knows the response, as the response of any nation would be if its own population was taking rocket fire, would be to hit back at the sources of the rocket strikes. Um, in Australia, if we were taking rocket fire here, I expect our population would be calling our political leadership and saying, what are you doing to stop this? Um, it's that Israel has a right to self-defence. They don't choose to ha initiate a conflict with Hamas. They didn't initiate this conflict with Hamas. I think it's regrettable Hamas did so, but it's been to the detriment, certainly, of the Gazan civilian population, without doubt, and, and the Israeli population too. When you say Israel has a right to self-defence, what you're actually asking us to embrace as a proposition is that an occupier and a coloniser, a state that is based on a racial apartheid system... I don't accept settler, any of those characterisations. Well, the, the most, in, the most um, prestigious human rights organisation, Human Rights Watch, found in its report last month that Israel is practising apartheid. Uh, it I is... To be clear, they talked about a form of apartheid. I mean, they weren't calling it an apartheid state. Hamish, if Palestinian, in Palestinian intellectuals, activists, lawyers have for years been recording, and Israeli human rights organisations, that Israel is a settler apartheid state. It is an apartheid state that preferences one racial group over another. It is infused in every single aspect of its legal processes, its ethnic cleansing, its depopulation processes, its military occupation, its brutal military occupation in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, in Gaza, its brutal siege on Palestinians in Gaza. Even in 
it affects Palestinians in the diaspora. My father is here today. He's older than the State of Israel. He was born in 1945. He has experienced three Nakbas, 1948, exiled in 1967, and today the ongoing Nakba. He cannot return to his house, which is still there, because he is a Palestinian. When we return as a Palestinian, we have to go there on our Australian passport and we're at the mercy of a soldier, a conscript, who will decide whether we can enter. He gave us three days the last visit. Any Jewish person in this audience today automatically has a right to return and live in my father's birthplace. Don't tell me that's not apartheid. Uh, Jen Robinson. I have to agree with Randa. I mean, it's one thing, Dave, to say that Israel has the ability to respond to rocket strikes, but in such a disproportionate and indiscriminate manner. If we look at the figures, just from the most recent conflict in the past month, something like 248 Palestinians have been killed, including 66 children. Mm. Israel has been indiscriminately targeting journalists, the bombing of media organisations. This is a deliberate attack on media freedom and also the ability of the world to understand what is happening on the ground. I've been working with the International Federation of Journalists working on the issue of the targeting of journalists and there is case after case of people wearing clear press vests being snipered in the context of the Great March. Unbelievable targeting. It is not correct to say that Israel is right and is using the appropriate use of force in response to what Hamas has been doing. This is an unlawfully occupied people who have suffered great disadvantage, discrimination and human rights violations. It does, there is a definition under international law of apartheid, Human Rights Watch, B'Tselem, other Israeli human rights groups agree that it meets that definition. And it's time that the Australian government starts taking appropriate action. I am continually embarrassed by the conduct of the Australian government at the Human Rights Council, at the Security Council, voting against every single attempt for human rights accountability for what Israel and Hamas are doing. If the Australian government is so concerned about Hamas bombings, then why did we oppose the International Criminal Court having jurisdiction to look into the crimes of both sides of the conflict? Let's let Dave respond to that. <laughs> I, I don't pretend the answers are um, easy here, but uh, is. And I'm not here as the spokesperson for Israel, for that matter. I'm, I'm here as an Australian parliamentarian who's here as a representative of Australia. But having lived in the region, um, I can tell you that, the, the, firstly, things are not as clear-cut as they might seem. Israel has not been in Gaza since 2005. They withdrew from Gaza. Shortly after Israel withdrew, Hamas took over Gaza. Hamas is committed to, in its own charter to the destruction of the State of Israel um, and uh, to imposing Islamic law upon what was historically the territory of Palestine. They're perfectly free to do that, but they're a listed terrorist organisation. Now, in my own experience, and this is certainly true of the Palestinian political leadership in the West Bank, um, Fatah, they would like to have a two-state solution. They support a negotiated two-state solution, but Hamas does not in Gaza. They've never uh, accepted Israel's right to exist. They've never agreed to abide by previous peace agreements, such as the Oslo agreements, um, and they've never uh, disavowed the use of terrorism as a, as a, as a, as a tool. Now, and until such time as the Palestinian political leadership can be reunified in some way or that Hamas agrees to a political settlement to this conflict, I think it's difficult for Israel to unilaterally solve this one. I mean, you know, it's, it's just... not a conflict between Israel and Hamas. Hamas is not in the West Bank. Hamas is not in um, is not part of the Palestinians who are living as second-class citizens in Israel. I mean, this is a constant... Um, you've just basically ticked off every Hasbara argument of this Israeli lobby. The idea that, first of all, it's our fault that we are occupied. It's our fault that we haven't got a peace agreement. It's our fault. It's Hamas's fault that we are being bombed. Always putting the onus back on Palestinians when it is Israel who is the occupier it is Israel who is um, instituting a brutal occupation in the West Bank, in Gaza. And, it, and don't tell me that Israel withdrew. Gaza has been under military siege for 14 years. Nobody can leave. There is no freedom of movement, of medicine, of goods. I'd love um, to hear your is... solution. What, what's your solution? Uh, I, sol I just actually want to broaden this conversation out to the rest of the panel. Mitch, I'm interested, without asking you to wade into, into, the, into the detail of all of this, how do you observe it? How do you watch a conflict like this unfold? We are talking about... Occupation. We are talking about people in the traditional lands, historic lands, um, uh, religious beliefs and their connection with place. H how do you view it? Look, first and foremost, I'm not a political man, but, um, you know, I'm a man, I think, that tries to operate through his heart and spirit. And, um, you know, I feel like I don't know enough, but, you know, where there's innocent lives being lost and talk of... It's not apartheid, it's just elements of apartheid. It's not cool, you know. Um, 
obviously I can relate on different multitudes because of historically what's happened here with our people and the ongoing genocide that is still current here today that we don't always like to hit front on and, you know, say say what it is, you know, and over-representations. And I feel like it, it comes a time where us as human beings, we need to come together and look past religion and all of these things that we use to divide us and not use to actually come together and love and accept. Because at the end of the day, in, you know, Palestine, young people are dying, I'm sure, in Israel too. But it comes back to the occupier and if it's really geared, is it, is it colonisation and we're trying to wipe out a culture here, you know, that's not OK. And, I mean, look at, you know, 250 kilometres off the shore of Australia and you talk about West Papua, I bet 90% of people in here don't even know what is going on there. There's a media blackout there. Um, you know, there's 60,000 unaccounted lives since 2018. There's the largest gold mine on the planet, second largest rainforest. It's absolutely been raped of its resources. Um, the Australian government has done heaps of stuff with the Indonesian military, um, and yet that military is doing things and committing acts of genocide. I mean, that's a shorter trip for those that don't understand. To get from the top of Australia to West Papua, it's shorter than Sydney to Canberra, and we don't know anything about it. So, I mean, there is things happen happening everywhere that's absolutely horrific, and it's all genocide, and it's all about control and occupation, and it's all about dominance. And there comes a time where we have to come together and say enough's enough, because, you know what, we're, we are losing kids day after day here. Every day we lose our kids. We've got some of the highest rates of suicide in the planet, over-incarceration, domestic violence, you know, the list goes on, deaths in custody. And these things are happening over here in Palestine, you know, West Papua, it goes on and on and on. And it comes a time where we have to put the guns down, so to speak, and just go, you know what, we have to come up with a solution here because we can't let any more lives be lost, you know. And what you said, bloodshed. is... is I think that you just said now is connected by one thread, and that is settler colonialism. When you're talking about West Papua, when you're talking about Australia, when you're talking about Palestine. And, Dave, you asked me what the solution is, and it's not the... It, this is not complicated. That, that, that is often used as an excuse, and it's used as an excuse to say, it's too difficult, we're just going to accept the status quo, which is basically asking Palestinians to relinquish their basic human rights. It's asking Palestinians to embrace a status quo where they are second-class citizens, where they must accept being subjugated and oppressed and repressed and not being able to live with dignity the way we all expect that we are allowed to be able to, to live with dignity. So when you say, what is the solution? The solution is impose sanctions on Israel. Make injustice a bad investment. Investment. Impose sanctions, impose an arms embargo, implement the boycott divestment sanctions movement. But with Withdraw... a view to a two-state solution, is that your suggestion? A two-state solution is something Israel doesn't even want through its but illegal do you want settlements. It? I'm, I'm just trying no, to understand. No, I what... don't, because okay. it's impossible. We at so the what moment, do you want? I want one state where every human being is treated equally, and I want. That's... What is so radical about that? I don't think I don't think the Palestinians want one state, and I don't think yes. Israelis want one state. Well, either. Israelis, I mean, we know, don't because the majority of Israelis and their government. I would be hesitant insist... to impose upon people something that they're not asking for themselves. Israel is the occupier. Okay. Israel is in an illegal occupation. So, before we even talk about Rana... what's going to happen once we're free, just set us free first.